welcome Dale to our circle here. Dale believes in the provocative, healing, inspiring power of poetry to help each of us build a life and future worth living. He believes great poems are like powerful apps for the mind, good stories with all the boring parts removed. Mm. And Dale, I will hand it over to you and you are so welcome here. Thank you, Narit, so much. And also a special thanks to the Lake Erie Institute for uh, putting this gathering on and for arranging all of this. And, and uh, also particularly welcome to everybody that's here. I see, I see uh, uh, longtime friends and also uh, folks that I hope will become longtime friends. So it's wonderful to be here. Okay, well, thanks again for all of you being here. And I was thinking, um, <laughs> describing this rewilding our soul journey, what actually would this be? And using poetry, of course, to do that. And I thought if I were going to come up with a rather big and bodacious vision, that it would go something like this, which is to expand today, not contract, to expand our moral, political, and particularly focused on our ecological imagination. But I think that's what we're up to today. And I say that because I don't know about you all, but the opposite of the expanded feeling is one of contraction, feeling of pain, even despair, and then ultimately, uh, I think we go into a kind of uh, inaction when we sort of spiral down into that particular uh, feeling. And so I thought to myself, what, well, what do we do? I mean, what, what can we do about this and how can poetry help? Well, that, that of course, is what we're going to try to answer over the next uh, minutes and hour and a half or so. Um, but I think that it has to do with connection. And if I had to go to one root cause of what has, has us in such a difficult situation in our world today, particularly around the natural world, ecologically, it's because of this profound disconnection that we feel. And I think what, what poetry does, it's elixir, it's expanding force, it's magic even is this ability to have us feel more connected first to ourselves and then to others and then to the great other, which again is what we're so focused on. And I think that sort of by definition, what we're saying is that a wild, free and untrammeled soul by definition is one that is connected that that's uh, what I'm imagining. And I wanted us to start right in the deep end of the pool today. Uh, so I thought we would start with a few uh, lines by an amazing poet, um, T.S. Eliot. And this comes from a very long poem, The Four Quartets. Anyway, let me just say it. Not known because not looked for. Not known because not looked for, but heard half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. Quick now, here now, always, always a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. Now, I think that one of the reasons that I wanted to start with those few lines by T.S. Eliot, one is I want to tell you a little story to kind of ground those words, but the other is that I think that this major shift that we're talking about, and I know with many on this call, I'm singing to the choir, as they say, you know, because many of you have already thought deeply about this whole question of the natural world and, and, and what's at stake. And the thing is, is that I believe, though, that this major shift that we're going to have to take is not going to be simply driving a few more electric cars. It's not going to be putting a few solar panels up on the roof, although those things are great. I don't discount those things. 
but it's going to require something much more foundational. And I think when the poet talks about this, a condition of complete simplicity, what does it cost? Not less than everything. So there's a more fundamental change, I think, that we are needing and what's pointing to. Now, I want to tell you a little story. Let's just ground this down in, as we say sometimes, the real world, as if we knew what that was. I was coming out of a food store. This is two or three years ago. And uh, I happened to be in one of those. I don't know if you guys know, you know, the, the to-do list days where you're just cooking, you're just booking, you're just getting, go to the store, do this, pay the bills, blah, 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 right? And so I was on that kind of mission that day and I was coming out and there was a bunch of other people and we were all rushing out the door and, uh, and you know, just everything had to work perfectly for us to get out that door. And so all of a sudden, like on a freeway, when somebody slams on the brakes and you start seeing, you know, the backup, that's what happened to us, about four or five people, groceries and all this kind of stuff. And so I looked around, I wasn't right in front, but I looked around and I could see the offending party. And it was two-year-old, looked like a little two-year-old girl. And what she had done is she had stopped and stopped all this traffic right outside the market. She squatted down sumo wrestler type, you know, with like a two-year-old can do in, in a kind of a comfortable fashion. And she was squatted in front of what looked like a, um, one of the, it's like a gardenia bush or a gardenia plant in a little one gallon pot. Squatted, looking eye to eye, nose to nose, toe to toe to that plant. And she screams at the top of her voice, it's a flower. It's a flower. And it took me a moment to get out of my grumpy self because my grumpy self was what in the hell? What's going on here? I got stuff to do, right? But all of a sudden, and, and to her dad's credit, he didn't just like rush her off. To his credit, he, you know, he was juggling stuff. He, he kind of went along with the gag and, and she was there. And all of a sudden I looked and I went, she's right. That little girl's right. It is a flower. And I looked up and I said, that is an amazing cloud. That is incredible blue sky up there. I've got this bag of groceries that's going to make this incredible dinner tonight. A two-year-old doesn't need T.S. Eliot. But we do, I think. Because the two-year-old goes in and out, mostly in to that state of complete simplicity. But that's what she was talking about. And that's what's at stake for us. I talk sometimes about stealth poetry. And, you know, again, a little, this two-year-old little girl was such a mentor to me, such a wise being to teach me what it's like to live life in that moment of complete simplicity. And so I've thought to myself over the years, because I have, uh, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do is I've tried to drag poetry into some, vi <laughs> some places where poetry is not normally, uh, you know, uh, talked about. And in the, in the business world, I, uh, I have done that. And I think that there's this idea that we need to sneak up on ourselves. I mean, I love poetry. I've loved poetry for years. But I get just as caught up in life, in, in, in rushing to-do lists, and I need those places where I get stopped, where all of a sudden I can become a seeker again. I can become a seeker again. And I think that sometimes a good poem can fly right up underneath the radar screen, screen of our strategic minds right directly to the heart. And I want to talk to you about a poem that I've used, and I'll tell you a story in just a moment about this particular poem. Many of you will be familiar with this, but I think if we were going to say, you know, Nareet and I were talking about what is an eco poem? Well, I don't know, but let's figure it out. And I think that if you're going to, if you're going to get into eco poems, then this woman's got to be on your radar list, Mary Oliver. 
So here's a poem, and then I, I want to tell you a story because I've used this poem in so many cases. This is what I consider to be a very, very sneaky and stealth poem because people who may not have read a poem for many years will be exposed to this one, and they will have, mm, they will be kidnapped in ways that they didn't expect. Mary Oliver, The Journey. One day, one day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankle, ankles, mend my life, mend my life. Each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. And it was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, but little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. Stand up, say that poem in a room full of codependents, and they all start crying. <laughs> what is the life? Who is the life? What is the life? The only life you can save. I've often said that a good poem is one where you come out of it on the other end different than you entered. So this poem... I think the way Mary Oliver, in the last part of that poem, she does this thing with sound that I think it's like we're already, we're already opened up, hopefully below, you know, the radar screen. But when she starts saying, as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. So I used this poem in a speech I gave some years ago, a number of years ago, to a group of large family-owned businesses. And there was a gentleman sitting at the front who, I'm going to date myself here, See if anybody under, if knows this reference. He was looking at me like the RCA dog. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you, know that, you know that famous ad where the dog is looking at the speaker intently? Well, that's how he was looking at me. And I couldn't tell whether it was, you know, like he was enjoying it or whether he was going, what is this guy saying? I wasn't quite sure. And so I, this poem I did late in the speech, and, and I worked it in somehow. He came up to me right after the speech, shook my hand, said, Dale, I loved what you did today. I've got another appointment, so i got to run. But I just wanted to tell you that. So at least I had a clue that he liked it, that his RCA dog look was, was one of, you know, hopefully, you know, that he was, had been interested in liking it. That night about 6 o'clock, I had to be, happened to be in my home office, and I, which, you know, usually wouldn't be answering the phone at six o'clock. But anyway, I picked up the phone and the other person on the other end said, this is Joelle Fisher. OK. Hi. And she said, I'm Fred. I'm the I'm the co-originator, co-founder of the winery. And Fred and I are married. I just want to tell you, I just want to say one thing. And I said, well, sure. What? She said, whatever you told Fred, you got to come up here and tell us. 
And I said, well, don't throw me in the briar patch. And so uh, I'll be up there as soon as I can. Now that started a multi-year relationship with the family and the winery, and it was just wonderful. But I asked Fred, I asked him later. Now you gotta know this, he is a trained engineer, brilliant guy, but so heady, so incredibly, uh, what do they say, left brain oriented, that this poem had, you know, it's like somebody who is a, um, what do they call it, reform smoker or something like that, where once they switch, they're like, they're, they, anyway. So I asked him, I said, Fred, what was it you, you liked about that poem? What was it that was interesting to you? And he said, well, what, he said, when we first started the winery years ago, an amazing winery, by the way, uh, with a, property in Napa and Sonoma, which is, you know, really unusual. But anyway, um, he said that we had a lot of pushback, people thinking that we were not going to be successful. And he said, you reminded me of how it felt both to be that scared and yet to have it work. And I said later when I'm talking to him, you know, those first few lines, one day you finally knew what you had to do. You know that day and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble. That's how it feels when you're going to do something significant. But what's interesting, and I had a conversation with Fred, and I said, Fred, you know, not like, you know, I mean, like I was suggesting it to him. But I said, often the most difficult voices are not the ones outside your head but the ones inside your head. And he said, yeah, I know. So, um, I, I want to be clear about this. I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with logical linear mind. In fact, we need to be brilliant. We need to be as smart as we can. It's just that there's been a palace coup and in our culture in particular, maybe in the West, what we've done is we have, we have advantaged our intellect so much that we, our, our heart and our intuitive sense, our nonlinear sense, we have uh, pushed to the side. So I think that's one of the reasons why we need more and more um, uh, poetry that, that allows us to do this. So I said to myself, what is an eco poem? <laughs> it has to do one or more of the following. And I, you know, I thought, this is not an exhaustive list. And I'll be curious if others have different things you would add. If you have a thought, we're going to have a, you know, we'll have a time for conversation at the, at the end of our time together. So make a note, put it in the chat, you know, or make a note there where you are. But I said, what is an eco poem? Well, it's got to, it's got to have something about the natural world. And it would help if it has some awe of the natural world. And if it praises and describes in a way, that'd be a cool thing. Human relationship within the natural world, as the great writer Wallace Stegner said, we ought to be good animals. And in a famous letter that he wrote, quote says, one means of sanity, one means of sanity is to retain a hold on the natural world to remain in so far as we can good animals. And to be a good animal, I think we have to do, and a good eco poem speaks to this third bullet point, regeneration and stewardship. I think that has something to do with being a good animal. Also, as I've already talked about, a good eco poem integrates head and heart. I studied for many years under uh, Wendy Palmer and uh, George Leonard. I studied the martial art of Aikido, and this particular deal behind me is uh, the three great shapes of Aikido. And the idea is to integrate the head and the heart, and the Japanese call this mysterious but also literal place in the center. They call it the hara, H-A-R-A. -A. So I sometimes say, because it's good alliteration, that we need to integrate head, heart, and hara. And when we've done that, that means that our head and our heart are informing the actions that our feet are taken, are taking, 
or the Hara. And then, of course, the last one is to rewild the soul. The head is brilliant at understanding how to do something. But it is the heart that tells us if we ought do it. Okay. We can't have an eco-poetry event without including a poem by David Wagner. I'll tell you a little story about him after I do the poem. It's called Lost. Imagine that a elder would be answering a young indigenous boy or girl when they ask the question, what do I do when I'm lost in the forest? Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is a place called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger, must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen, listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. How many times when we're lost in the world do we imagine that we need to just be still and silent and let the natural world, let the forest find us? So one night years ago, I was preparing for a class, a series of classes actually, and I was using this poem. I'd love this poem, I've loved this poem for years and years and years. And so I got this bright idea uh, about 12, 12.30, I'm burning the midnight oil preparing for this class. And I thought, I'm gonna see if I can find David Wagner's email address, because I wanna understand what he was thinking about when he wrote this poem. So I found it. He used to, he taught, he's, he's an emeritus professor at the University of Washington. And so I actually found an email, but I had no idea. I said, oh, this is probably old, he'll never get it. But on the long shot that he'll get it, I wrote, dear Mr. Wagner, da 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 da, and I asked him some questions. 15 minutes later, in my email, David Wagner's writing me back. <laughs> What? <laughs> so I opened it up. He basically said that he literally had only moved to Washington about a month or two before he wrote, wrote this poem, and he was lost in the forest. He was lost, and when he came out, he wrote this poem. So it was, it was literal. I found a quote by uh, Daniel Wildcat, who is a Native American elder. He said this, We live among relatives not resources. We live among relatives, not resources. And I thought to myself, David Wagner, 30, 35 years ago, whenever he wrote this poem, he said, if what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, oh, you are surely lost. You are surely lost. I was talking to a group of high school kids one time, and I was using this poem this years ago. And, uh, you know, I learned a long time ago when you speak to high school kids that you, you got to, whoever's the cool kid in the, in the room, you got to befriend them. If you don't, <laughs> you're in trouble. So anyway, this kid was, you know, like, I don't know, he, I, I can't remember, but I said, if you want to think about this poem, think about it's 12 o'clock, you're in the city, 
and you're in a parking garage and you get on that elevator and there's this person standing there. It's about six, five. You can't see their face because they're just looking ominous. I said, that is the powerful stranger that Wagner's talking about in that poem. You treat that powerful stranger with respect. Oh, there's a picture of David Wagner. I wanted to show you what he looks like. He is um, about 94, 95 years old now. I'm, I'm not sure when that po uh, picture was taken, but he's still writing poetry. He is still cooking. Okay, I just had to include this poem for a lot of reasons. So um, let's do this one. Uh, somebody said you do that first line back east, particularly in places where there are a lot of there's a lot of Puritan orientation and people go, what? <laughs> you do not have to be good. You do not have to be good. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Oh, tell me about despair yours and I will tell you mine meanwhile the world goes on meanwhile the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees the mountains and the rivers meanwhile the wild geese high in the clear blue air are heading home again whoever you are Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. Calls to you. Calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting. Over and over announcing your place in the family of things. There's not too many poems. I've loved this poem for a long time too, but there's not too many poems that have more permission in them than this poem. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely. That's all of us. That's every piece of us. There's so many juicy images and surprises in this poem. You know, uh, a poet once said, if the poet is not surprised, the reader will not be either. So one of the wonderful things about writing poetry and reading good poetry is to have the poet, have yourself, if you're writing it, surprise yourself. You know, um, to, to learn things that you didn't know you knew. One, one wise person, a poet named David White, said, I gave up science for poetry because poetry was so much more precise. And the great scientist, speaking of scientists, of our interior, Sigmund Freud once said this, everywhere I go as a scientist, I find a poet has beat me there. This poem, how many uh, uh, characteristics of an eco poem does it have? Oh, I don't know. It has lots, lots. And it talks about the natural world, talks about humans within the natural world, talks about regeneration, stewardship, integration of head, heart, and horror, all that stuff. By the way, Mary Oliver is, uh, people talk about her because uh, what is, interesting about her is she hardly had any people in her poems never had people actually in her poems but every poem she wrote was about people or for people and um, I was also thinking about one of my mentors his name was Jim March taught at Stanford for many years I met him late in his life he said you know Dale he said everybody ought to be one part plumber and one part poet that's what we need. And I said, you know, he's right. I don't know about you all, but speaking of the half-life of, of courage, of gratitude, of feeling connected, of flow, of being in the zone, I don't know about you, but mine's really short. <laughs> Maybe you too sometimes. And so um, I was thinking that, oh, by the way, I'm using that word 
courage in the older sense. If you think about the word itself, core means heart, core. So courage means to know your heart and to be willing to follow it. Courage. So I wrote a little poem some years ago to try to help me help remind myself how often and how quickly I forget to be courageous and all these other things that I strive toward and um, and and disconnected. And I feel like, by the way, we're the only creature that can go against our nature. If you think about it. You know, it's it's pretty wild that way. But when we're feeling disconnected, we're detached, we tend to be the most dominating, especially when it comes to nature, the natural world, and each other, actually. And that's when we're the most destructive. So we have a real reason to feel connected. Oh, by the way, there's Mary Oliver. Of course, many of you know that. I love this. Poetry is a life-cherishing cherishing force, for poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down to the lost, something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. So when I forget that, and I forget to be courageous, and I forget to be grateful, this was a little poem I wrote some years ago to try to help remember. I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm feeling connected, I, I don't imagine I'll ever feel unconnected. And when I'm feeling unconnected, I can't ever imagine I will feel connected again and good and strong. Anyway, I wrote this little piece. Each day, the engine of my gratefulness must be coaxed and primed into action. Of course, like any old clunker, it would just as soon stay put. For even after the labored start beats the inertia and the plume of white smoke struggles upward, ah, oh, the same hills appear, soaring daily, tall and ominous as before. There is the long, slow hill of aging, so gradual and smooth at first. And then that steep grade called the news Oh boy. Yes, and always, always some mountain of a war looming out there, never too far in the distance. Even an old idea or a feeling long abandoned might conspire to halt this fragile progress, valves sputtering, tires flattening, clutch slipping. But the old potato, 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 sound of the engine, and all its mysterious fuel, for which I am truly grateful, somehow, somehow, keeps stumbling along. If we can't forgive ourselves for becoming uncourageous, for becoming ungrateful. If we can't forgive ourselves for, you know, I had this moment behind that little girl. It's a flower. I had a moment where I'm going, get off my lawn. <laughs> if we can't forgive ourselves for those moments, I think we're in trouble. And you know, I believe that in this old statement, Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And if we let ourselves get profoundly hurt and we do not heal, then we're liable to do a lot of damage. Ah, but what the poet Rumi says is that if your heart is pure, you are helping people you will never know or see. Okay. In closing, three questions. What poems do you need to integrate your head, your heart, and your hara, your center, your body? What poems do you need? What poems should you stash away? What poems should you put around your house, hidden, or in your car, so that when you're feeling just at the lowest point, you'll find it 
and it'll save you. What poems reconnect you to yourself, to others, and to the great other? And how will you remember? Now, I use that word. That's why I break it apart. Think of what that word actually is saying. By the way, if you love poetry, you eventually you become a word nerd. And if you think about what remember, it means to re put ourselves together to remember ourselves. And a good poem, just like a good walk in the forest, a good meal, a good conversation with a loved one with a dear friend, all those things help us um, remember ourselves, bring us back to a com condition of complete simplicity. Bring us back to, maybe you think about that little girl. It's a flower. <laughs> maybe you think that all of a sudden you uh, imagine we live in the world, not on it. We say metaphorically, oh, we live on the planet. No, we don't live on the planet. We live in the planet. We've got three miles of air above us, clouds, all of that. We live there. And so that's those three questions. And uh, I thought just, just to kind of close out, there's another quote, the soul would much rather fail at its own life than succeed at someone else's. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's fierce and, and loving at the same time. And then Ann Carson said, myths are stories about people who become too big for their lives temporarily so that they crash into other lives or brush against gods. In crisis, their souls are visible. And finally, I would say, you know, it's going to take as many wild souls as possible for us to pull the fat out of the fire. Because, you know, we've got some pretty difficult um, things staring us in the face, given the natural world and what's happened. And um, so we need as many wild souls as possible. And the very last thing I'm going to say, well, actually, I want to say this. I want to say, so what will you do with your one wild and precious soul she actually, Mary Oliver said life, but I've changed it. And the very last thing I'm going to say, and then we'll open it up, is a quote by Robin Wall Kimmer, who's an amazing Native American and professor and scientist. And she said this, even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily, and I must return the gift. And your gift has been your listening ear, so thank you so very much for that. Thank you. <laughs>